Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Inshallah ta'ala tonight we're going to be continuing with the first and we now get into the life of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu who of course is one of the 10 that was promised paradise, one of Ashram al-Bashirin al-Jannah. Now, uh, just like with some of the other companions, we're not going to cover in detail his life after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but just some of the qualities and how they played out as things went on, but really focusing on how he comes into the story of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to the early story of al-Islam. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is from the tribe of Zuhra, Banu Zuhra, and he is related to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam specifically through his grandfather who is the brother of the mother, I'm sorry, the brother of the father of the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu I know it's probably hard for you to see all that, so let me explain it inshallah ta'ala a little bit better. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu mother, of course, is Amina bint Wahb, and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu's grandfather is Wahib, the brother of Wahb. Okay, so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas ibn Wahib, and the Prophet Sallallahu of course, who is the son of Amina bint Wahb, Wahab and Wahab are brothers, hence the Prophet ﷺ would say, Hada Khali, this is my maternal uncle, when he would look at Sa'id, so let one of you show me his Khal, let one of you show me his maternal uncle. Who can have an uncle like this? So Sa'id is related to the Prophet ﷺ. once again, he is his maternal uncle in that sense. However, he's at least 20 years younger than the Prophet ﷺ. I know that sometimes when the narration gets quoted, there is this idea of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu as an elderly man in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But of course, when we say he's the uncle, it's only in that sense. And he was actually a teenager when the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. So let's go through his story, inshaAllah ta'ala. His kunya, his nickname was Abu Ishaq. So if you know someone who's named Sa'ad, who's also Abu Ishaq, this is uh, of course very common, uh, especially with some of the Mashaykh. We have our own Sheikh Sa'ad Abu Ishaq here in Dallas, Alhamdulillah. You have many Sheikh Sa'ad Abu Ishaqs in different places, uh, some famous and, and some, some not as much, but this comes from Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, himself. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is receiving revelation, the position of Sa'ad in society is the following. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was someone who used to make bow and arrows. So we talked about Khabbab and how he, how skilled Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was in making fine swords for people. Uh, Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was specifically known for making bow and arrows. And at the same time, he himself was a great archer. He was someone that was known for his genius in that sense in archery. And of course that would come to play in Islam. Uh, he was a teenager, his father had already passed away. And so while he's making these bow and arrows and he's someone who's recognized for his genius, he's someone who's recognized for his archery himself, he's someone who's recognized uh, for the uh, the vision that he had radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, in the sense of his archery. He also had a very unique uh, appearance. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was uh, described in the physical appearance as, as someone who looked like a lion. Uh, he was a lion in that, not, not necessarily in his strength, in his physical makeup, but literally in regards to the amount of hair that he had radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, he was short, uh, very dark, very, you know, had a lot of hair on his body, had long hair and had a lot of strength. And again, you know, he's someone that is uh, known for his archery, his skill in archery. So how does he come into the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in the sense of an Islam? He's someone who is very honest, who is considered from the du'afa of Mecca, from the week of Mecca, not necessarily in that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is from the, those who are enslaved, they're from those who are poor or who are you know, going through some, certain things. But that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is not someone who has power in society, um, despite of course not coming from uh, a lowly tribe. Uh, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu in a narration from his daughter Aisha, uh, she says, describing, and this is in some of the books of Seer, that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu describes having this dream. He says, رَأَيْتُ فِي الْمَنَامِ قَبْلَ أَنْ أُسْلَمْ I saw in my dream before I became Muslim, كَأَنِّي فِي ظُلْمَةٍ لَا أُبْصِرُ شَيْئًا As if I am in this uh, wide, dark plain, I don't see anything. So I just see darkness everywhere. 
And subhanAllah, you'll notice, by the way, many of the early Muslims, especially that first group, that first batch, they saw something of a dream before they came to the Prophet wasallam. So he's seeing this dream where it's just complete pitch black, it's complete darkness. He said, so suddenly, Allah Ali Qamar, um, suddenly this moon appeared, this, this full moon appeared. He says, فَأَتْبَعْتُهُ So I followed the moon. And he said, at that point, I'm looking to see who is in front of me or who has reached the moon prior to me. So I go and I follow the moon in my dream. And he says, suddenly I look and I see Zayd ibn Haritha, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abu Bakr as Siddiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. So think about the dream. He's going, it's darkness. He sees the full moon. He follows it and then he sees in front of the moon. Uh, Ali, Zayd, and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. So he says, so I asked them, uh, Mata ataytum ila ha huna? When did you get here? When did you make it to the moon? So they said, just now, a sa'a. Uh, so he said that I immediately went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he said when I woke up, I heard that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was calling to Islam privately. He said, so I went quickly to the streets of uh, Ajiyad, to Sha'bi uh, Ajiyad, he says, and I had found Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu called me to Islam, and so I accepted Islam, and he was amongst the first to accept Islam in that sense. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, and I'm paraphrasing this, uh, this part, but Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that no one embraced Islam before the day which I embraced Islam. Uh, and no doubt I remained for seven days as one third of the Muslims. So he's describing himself as thuluthul uh, Islam in the sense that he had, uh, you know, he, you know some, of the, some of the ways to look at this is some of the scholars said he was the seventh person to accept Islam, but that he accepted Islam uh, very early on. And as we said, you're going to find narrations uh, like the ones of Lubaba radiallahu ta'ala anha and Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu and others when we get to Ibn Mas'ud and Abu Dhar and others. Uh, may Allah be pleased with them all. And the uh, timing of their embrace of Islam is not as, um, is not as certain as the timing of uh, Khadija and Ali and Zayd and Abu Bakr. Uh, may Allah be pleased with all of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma ameen. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu is very early on and based upon some of these narrations, you know, around the exact same time as Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, right after uh, Abu Bakr, Ali, and Zayd, um, and Khadija, and some of those early converts to Islam. So anyway, uh, when Sa'ad accepts Islam, he's only a teenager. And this is also something to keep in mind, that there is a thread with Al-Ashr Mubashirin Al-Jannah that we'll see, the 10 promised paradise, that half of them embraced Islam as teenagers, and half of them embraced Islam through Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's one of those who embraced Islam through Abu Bakr, and he was a teenager and he was unmarried and he lives with his mother. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu goes, accepts Islam with the Prophet sallallahu and then he goes home to tell his mother that he accepted Islam. Now when he tells his mother that he accepted Islam, his mother uh, goes into an extreme fit of anger and she starts to chastise him and she says, what is this deen that you have embraced? that took you away from the deen of your mother and your father. And she, uh, you know, she, she yells at him, she shows a lot of rage. And as Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu insists that this is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is the religion of God, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is a messenger of Allah. And she knows that she cannot argue with him in that sense. Then she goes to the next step, and this gives us another layer of the early entrance into Islam, the people that accepted Islam early. She's not going to torture Sa'ad the way that some of the parents tortured their children. She's not going to beat him or call for someone to physically torture him. What she would do to him is actually probably worse, which is she would torture herself to guilt him. SubhanAllah, this is another layer to the early converts of Islam, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward those who accept Islam and who go through these trials in so many different ways. This is one of the early examples, and in fact, the earliest example of a parent that will hurt herself to try to deter her son to leave Islam. So she's not going to call anyone to torture him. Instead, she says to him, listen, either you leave Islam or I will not eat, I will not drink, 
I will not shelter myself, I will not comb my hair. So she goes and she sits outside and she says, I'm going to dehydrate myself, I'm going to starve myself, I'm going to let the lice creep into my hair. And she says that, you know, uh, if you don't come back to Islam, your, your heart will be, I'm sorry, if you don't come back leaving Islam, if you go, don't come back to your religion, then it's your heart that's going to be broken, you're going to be consumed with regret and remorse, and the people will condemn you forever. SubhanAllah, think about the guilt, and Sa'ad loves his mother. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu loves his mother. Think about the pain that is being caused to him. SubhanAllah, this is different than having someone whip you and burn you and, and do some of the things that were done to the other companions. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, Ya Ummah, oh my mother, don't do it. Oh my mother, stop. He pleads with her. When he sees her becoming weak and she's fulfilling her oath, her promise is, is, is showing that you know, she's, she's getting sicker and uh, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu keeps on coming to her and he keeps on insisting, he keeps bringing food and drink, he keeps trying to cover her. He's trying, Ya umma, oh my mother, don't do this to yourself. And she keeps on saying, not until you abandon your religion, not until you abandon your religion. And eventually, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he comes to a point where he says, Ya umma, as much as I love you, my love for Allah and the Messenger وسلم, is stronger. And he, he tells her, he says, even if you had a hundred souls and they departed one after the other, then I would not give up my religion. This is not a, a pursuit. This is not something that's going to yield any type of fruit. You're going to die. I'm going to live with regret, but I'm not going to leave my religion. I can't leave my deen. So if this is meant to deter me from leaving my deen, it's not going to work. Ya Ummah, I believe in this. I love Allah and I love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So eventually when his mother saw that that type of, of, of guilting him and causing him that emotional pain was not going to work, eventually his mother gave up starving herself and hurting herself. And how would Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reveal Qur'an in regards to this incident? This is so powerful. Why? Because, you know, she was not doing this for him or she was not doing this to punish him as much as, you know, or, or out of a hatred for him. You know, there's something about the mother for her child, right? There's something that is natural there, even in the, uh, in the, in the wrongdoing or in the way that she was carrying out her actions in the wrong, trying to promote falsehood or trying to move him away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a mother who at the end of the day has love for her child and has rights upon her child. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal Qur'an censoring the mother of Sa'ad, they're talking bad about her or insulting her? No, instead the verses that would come down uh, in Surah Al-Ahqaf or Surah Al-Luqban, the ulama uh, talk about the nature of these verses, which are the same. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا We have enjoined man to treat his parents with excellence. Treat your mother with excellence. And Surah Al-Ahqaf, حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهَا وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهَا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا She already almost died for you when she brought you into this world. Right? She, she carried you in pain. She gave birth to you in pain. She, she nursed you in pain. She went through all of that for you in pain. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Luqman, which is what uh, most of the scholars say was revealed specifically in regards to the incident of Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was again mentioning the goodness of the, uh, the mother and the obedience that is owed to the parents. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That if they command you to worship other than me, don't insult them, don't curse them, don't tell them I don't care. No, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Simply do not follow them in that. And on top of that, what does Allah say? وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا معروفة. Then, you know, maintain a blessed company. Treat them well in this dunya. Treat them with absolute kindness in this world. So SubhanAllah, she was commanding him with kufr in Allah and Allah was commanding him with shukr of her at the same time. She was commanding him to disbelieve in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah was commanding him to show gratitude to her, to show excellence to her and kind treatment. SubhanAllah, and this is a message by the way, a lesson for all of us. You know, what is worse in terms of guilting a person and, and you know, uh, trying to take your child away from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in this way. And still Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا to treat, to treat her well. To treat both of your parents well. And in this context, Sa'ad radiAllahu Ta'ala Anhu, to treat her well. So what excuse do we have, right? When it comes to our parents, how should we be treating our parents? 
Uh, how should we be how should we be showing goodness uh, to them? Even in the situation here where you have a uh, you have a person, you have a woman that is telling her son to literally do kufr. And of course, what the Prophet said, لا طاعتني مخلوق في معصية الخالق that there is no obedience to a creation when the creation tells you to disobey the Creator. And so this is something that's very powerful with Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu and gives us an early look at some at a new layer of pain that some of these early Muslims had to endure Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu with his mother. And of course, he was not unique to that, right? We find that in the story of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his mother uh, and others as well um, that were guilted in a very different way uh, by their parents when they embraced Islam. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu insists upon Islam and he would accompany the Prophet sallallahu and he would bring the skill set that he had of archery with him. Uh, he would spend a lifetime at that point in the companionship and protecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so you find that uh, two firsts that are given to Sa'ad radiallahu anhu is he's the first to fight in the name of Islam uh, in the sense that uh, you know, there was a, a, an incident in which some of the Muslims went to pray in one of the valleys. At that point, they're not able to pray in front of the Kaaba, of course, but they went to pray in one of the valleys, which is the habit of the Prophet ﷺ in the early days was to pray in some secluded spots and some corners and some of the alleyways, other places where they would not be easily detected. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, was with a group of them when they were attacked and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the first to strike one of them and to shed uh, to, to shed a, a drop of blood in uh, defending the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam in that in, in those early days of persecution, uh, the first to throw an arrow in Islam. There's another incident, um, you know, uh, which could be referring to the same one where Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu had protected the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam by shooting an arrow um, in in his protection when he was ambushed with some of the Muslims early on. Uh, in Islam. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is going to always be the archer in protection of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he has a very specific honor in that regard. In Badr, after he makes hijrah alongside the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would be amongst those that would witness every battle with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he fought alongside the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bravely and he killed more than one person uh, in the capacity of that battle. And one of the shuhada of Badr, and you don't really hear much about the shuhada of Badr because they were so few, right? In Uhud, you had over 70. In Badr, you had 12, 14, 15 uh, that had passed away in total uh, in the Battle of Badr. And Allah knows best, but it's a small amount of people. One of them was the little brother of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who uh, embraced Islam late in Mecca uh, and made hijrah along with Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his name was Umair ibn Abi Waqqas. And he was so young at the Battle of Badr, uh, a teenager at the point of the Battle of Badr, that you know the Prophet Sallallahu did not want to let him accompany uh, the battle or accompany the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. And so he shows up and the Prophet Sallallahu notices him and the Prophet Sallallahu wants to send him home because he's so young and he insists. So he keeps on hiding in the ranks and he cries and he begs the Prophet Sallallahu uh, to be alongside them. And so the Prophet Sallallahu eventually accepted Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu to fight uh, alongside the Muslims in the Battle of Badr in which they were greatly outnumbered of course, but Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala gave them victory. And Umair ibn Abi Waqqas, the brother of Sa'ad uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu was one of the very few shuhada of Badr. One of the very few shuhada of Badr. And SubhanAllah, if you go visit uh, uh, Badr and you visit the shuhada, it's very emotional because they're, they're, it's, it's such a different way that that graveyard is. Um, and of course, the entire site of Badr from Mihja onwards to Umair ibn Abi Waqqas, they are listed and they are very far away from where, where people typically visit when they go uh, for Hajj or for Umrah. Uh, in Uhud, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu also enjoys a special distinction. Not only is he one of the few not to flee from the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he also continues to fight bravely alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and particularly using the skill of archery. Now, of course, archery was the advantage that the Muslims would have in their battles. And we know that uh, the reason why Uhud turned out the way that it did was because 40 of the archers came down before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave them permission to do so. 
And that, of course, led to them being weak and vulnerable from the other side. And so they did not have that advantage anymore with the archers. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was one of those who was around the Prophet sallallahu and particularly on the day of Uhud was picking up his, uh, his arrows and was shooting in every direction precisely, guarding the Prophet sallallahu So he was running with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was defending the Prophet sallallahu with his bow and arrow while others held swords. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was shooting one by one with the bow and arrow. And think about the scene on the day of Uhud. Uh, there were some that were catching arrows with their hands and with their backs, like Abu Dujana and Talha, may Allah be pleased with them, guarding the Prophet And there were some that were trying to defend the Prophet like Nusayba radiallahu ta'ala anha and Yazid ibn Sakan and others, may Allah be pleased with them, with their swords. Uh, think about Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu running around the Prophet and shooting these arrows and the companions were picking up arrows to give it to him and the Prophet himself was picking up arrows to give them to Sa'ad. All right, think about the scene. The Prophet and the companions are trying to give him as many arrows as possible because he's so precise, he's so quick, he's so brave in running around the Prophet and trying to defend him in that regard. And on that day, the Prophet would say to Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu something he would not say to anyone else. He said, Irmi, throw O Sa'ad, fidaka abi wa ummi. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you. This is something that's said to the Prophet Okay, uh, that the companions would say to the Prophet fidaka abi wa ummi, ya Rasulullah. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. But the Prophet saying to Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu on that day, throw your arrows, O Sa'id. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who of course uh, knows the Prophet and grew up with the Prophet and has that close relationship to the Messenger he said about that, uh, that saying of the Prophet he said, ما جمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أباهو وأمه لأحد إلا لسعد بن أبي وقاص that the Prophet never combined his mother and father in a statement like that except for Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas when he said to him, shoot O young man, irmi uh, O Sa'ad, shoot O Sa'ad, may my mother and father uh, be sacrificed for you. And this is narrated from another companion um, as well. The Prophet also gave Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu another gift when he said to Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to direct his aim and to respond to his duas to respond to the du'as of Sa'ad. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu is of course, someone whose du'as are mustajab, whose supplications are answered by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He says to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in his du'a, Allahumma stajib li Sa'ad idha da'ak. Oh Allah, respond to Sa'ad when he calls upon you. Oh Allah, respond to the du'as of Sa'ad when he calls upon you. And so Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu now has this gift in which his du'as are answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is significant going forward in the life of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu because everyone knew that Sa'ad's du'as were mustajab. And you don't want someone whose supplications are answers, whose, whose supplications are answered, whose du'as are mustajab to make du'a against you, okay? So people feared the du'a of Sa'ad, as we'll see uh, in some incidents uh, that took place later on, uh, because of the du'a of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the du'a of Sa'ad. And of course, especially when this is combined with the status of a madhloom, with the status of one who is wronged. And so we'll see later on in the life of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu that someone wrongs him. And this is when he was a governor, he was a governor in Iraq and someone makes a claim against him and it's wronging him, it's zulm to him. And he makes all of these lies and complaints to Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu about him. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu makes dua against that person. And that person loses his vision and lives in a horrible life, a horrible life in accordance with the way that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu had prayed against him. Uh, there's an incident that took place where uh, someone was cursing Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu or Ali and Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well in, uh, in, in another uh, 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 account. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu told him, he said, stop cursing Ali. And this was in Iraq. And he said to him, 
You know, the man said, or what? What are you going to do about it? He said, if you don't stop cursing Ali, then I will curse you. I'll make dua against you. And, you know, the, this man says that, go ahead. He mocks him. What do you, you know, what does that even mean, right? These people had lost appreciation. We talked about the way Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu was treated. What about Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu in this regard? So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he went and he made wudu and he prayed to rak'ahs and he made dua against the man. And they said that a beast came into Iraq and, and trampled the man like no one we'd ever seen. So this man's supplication was answered. And he, of course, it's not like Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu would use this uh, for small things. This was in the time of fitna and the time where people were using uh, language that was not befitting and of course stirring up certain things against the Khalifa of the time, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not uh, like that. And this was something that the Prophet وسلم, gave to him and of course he was a righteous man uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We also find in the time of the Prophet وسلم, that one of the most famous incidents um, or one of the most famous ahadith that we have today that guides our lives as Muslims actually comes from an incident with Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And that is in the time of Fatih Mecca, in the time of the conquest of Mecca, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, fell ill. And he got so sick uh, during Fatih Mecca, during the opening of Mecca, that um, he thought he was going to die. And I want you to just think about this incident because Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi of course. He's not that, that old even at this point, right? He's uh, still under the age of 40. And he only had one daughter at this point. And he had a lot of wealth. He was one of those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed with a lot of money. And he's known for his karam. He's known for his charity and his generosity. This is one of the various virtues of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was that he was one who used to give a lot of charity. And so he's with the Prophet ﷺ and he feels uh, sick and he feels like he's about to die. And the Prophet ﷺ visits him and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, O Messenger of Allah, I have all this money and I only have one daughter to inherit. Right? She's, and you know, she, she doesn't need all this money. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, can I give away two thirds of my wealth as charity? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. He said, Ya Rasulullah, can I give away half of my wealth as charity? And the Prophet ﷺ says, no. He says, well, can I give away one third of my wealth as charity in my inheritance? Can I will it that way? The Prophet ﷺ says, al-thuluth wa thuluth kathir. And of course, it's you know, something that we know in inheritance. He said, the third is enough and the third is a lot. This is the most that you can give, the maximum that you can give in charity in your inheritance uh, is one third of your wealth. And the Prophet ﷺ said, it's better to leave behind your dependents, uh, your heirs, not begging from others, but instead provided for. Right? It's better not to leave your family uh, in a way that they have to beg, but instead in a way that they're provided for. And he said, if you spend anything to gain in the, the if you spend anything seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be rewarded for it, even if it's a morsel uh, which you place in your wife's uh, mouth. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu gives us in that incident, or rather Allah gives us through that incident of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu thinking that he was going to die, uh, the designation of our inheritance that we should not give more than one third of our inheritance to charity. Of course, you can give as much as you want before the time of death comes, but not to leave your relatives behind in a desperate situation. And of course, this is something that we have. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu also gains something else. He gained the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma shfi Sa'da, Allahumma shfi Sa'd, Allahumma shfi Sa'd, oh Allah, cure Sa'd, oh Allah, cure Sa'd, oh Allah, cure Sa'd. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or when the Prophet ﷺ made that dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed cured Sa'd. And not only would Sa'd radiallahu ta'ala anhu live past Fatih Mecca, but he would be responsible for the largest swath of the world coming into uh, Islam, and that is of course under the Persian Empire. He would be responsible for leading the Muslim army uh, against uh, the Persian Empire, who of course showed all sorts of aggression towards the Muslims. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu would live to spread Islam throughout the Persian Empire. He would live to spread Islam throughout different corners of the world, as we'll talk about. And he would be the last person to die from Al Ashr Mubashirin. He'd actually be the last person to pass away from the 10 Promised Paradise. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's dua for Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was answered and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu would live 
uh, throughout the lives of Khulafa al-Rashidin, throughout the lives of the Khulafa uh, into uh, the era uh, of Muawiyah and would pass away at that time, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu. So let's talk about that for a moment, inshallah ta'ala. Just end with some of these contributions in that sense and some of these qualities. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Allah, cure Sa'ad. Sa'ad was cured. May Allah be pleased with him. And he was appointed under Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the commander of the army when the, uh, when the uh, battle ensued between uh, the Muslims and the Persian Empire at the time. And of course, we know the cruelty, the size, the strength of the Persian Empire under Kisla. Right? This was supposed to be to the Persian Empire, at least, they were supposed to easily crush the Muslims. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, had other plans. And Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu is leading the Muslims through some of the, uh, you know, the most devastating and, and harsh battles that would take place. The, the famous battle of Qadisiyah. The famous battle of Qadisiyah. Or, the, or, or, or the, the battle with the elephants, where, you know, uh, Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu came up with the strategy as the Persians employed el elephants against uh, the Muslims at the time. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu came up with a strategy to strike the elephants with arrows in their eyes, right? To try to slow them down, to try to make things easier for the Muslims since they were armored up. Even the elephants were covered except for their eyes. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu took the Muslims through all of these different um, battles and um, particularly where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Baytu Kisra, or Al Ali Kisra, that the, the house, the palace of Kisra, the palace of Khosro, the emperor of Persia, the ruler of Persia, who had the largest palace um, in the world. And the Prophet ﷺ ta talked about, um, you know, uh, Suraq ibn Malik, عنه, of course, receiving the bracelets of Kisra one day. Uh, this was a cruel emperor, the man who destroyed Jerusalem, killed 90,000 people in one day, the man who had done so much, uh, so much harm to the world and of course was, was, was an aggressive and arrogant person, super aggressive and arrogant person. And it was at the hands of Sa'ad anhu that he would find his defeat. And subhanAllah, one of the uh, incidents that I think about in this regard, uh, just from the journey of its starting, that. The last, the last episode of this bout in which Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu um, actually is able to conquer the palace of Madian, the palace of Kisla. Uh, uh, you know, this is an episode that, uh, you know, in Madainu Kisra, that, that when he's encroaching upon this, er this area in Iraq, this is an episode where you see two people whose lives started off in a very similar way even though they were in different corners of the world. And that is Sa'ad and Salman al-Farisi, may Allah be pleased with them. Salman is sitting behind Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And how did Salman get to that point? His father oppressed him for leaving their religion and for embracing, at that time, at least uh, a, you know, a monotheistic form of Christianity, an early form of Christianity, which would eventually lead him to Islam, right? And Salman ta'ala anhu would be tortured in Persia, would be chained up and tortured in Persia by his own father and would have to endure the pain of leaving those chains, escaping the chains of his father. Sa'ad ta'ala anhu having to endure the pain of his mother, uh, insisting upon him leaving Islam and enduring pain herself, which actually caused him great pain. And they are together as they enter upon this, uh, this palace the, uh, the, the very famous palace of Kisra. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, you know, gifts them and Allah azza wa jalla opens the doors for them and they spread Islam to that time, the largest empire in the world. So Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was someone who lived to see the spread of Islam uh, through Persia, who in fact was the architect of that spread of Islam uh, through Persia, the general, uh, who did so. He was also one of those who was appointed by Umar ibn Khattab anhu. at the time of Umar anhu being assassinated. He was appointed to the shura, to the council that would choose the next khalifa. And what you see with Sa'ad anhu is that he was someone who wanted no part of the glory or the leadership or the struggles or the strife that would take place afterwards. Sa'ad anhu was not someone who wanted to be in charge. 
He was not someone that wanted glory and he certainly did not want to be a part of the fight that would take place later on, the various fights and the battles that would take place in the fitna. He didn't want anything to do with any of that. He could have very well become a Khalifa himself because he was clearly amongst that small select group of people who were qualified right, to do so because the shura was to appoint a Khalifa amongst themselves. Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted to engage himself still in, uh, in, in, in uh, spreading this beautiful religion. And what you find from him is this insistence on being productive and this insistence on not getting involved in the fitna no matter what happens. This is Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu's position. And he narrated many of the ahadith in that regard. He narrated the hadith, Qital uh, al-Muslimi kufr, uh, fusuq, that to curse, uh, to fight a Muslim is kufr and to defame him is a form of, uh, of, of evil doing, is a form of obscenity. So he avoided the fighting of the Muslims, he avoided the defaming of the Muslims, he wanted nothing to do with that. He is the one who narrates the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that when fitna comes that there would be such a hard time of dissension that to sit in that time is better than to stand, to stand in that time is better than to walk, and to walk in that time is, to better, is better than running. Okay, meaning that the less you do in terms of getting involved when you see fitna break out, when you see dissension break out, the better. Um, and there are so many different parts of a hadith where he, uh, or different a hadith that he narrated in that regard, and he lived that out, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where when he was called to fights that were internal, he wanted nothing uh, to do with it. And that's where you find, subhanAllah, that uh, you know, some of the early historical accounts of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu being the one to spread Islam to China, right? To take the da'wah to China. SubhanAllah, I mean, and, and you find uh, some of the, uh, some, you know, the masjid of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu um, that, is, that is still there. And some of the early imprints of the da'wah that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu did, uh, even in going to China. And so there's a, a great lesson here that Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, I did not sign up for this go through all of this pain, shoot arrows on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu go through the emotional torture of having my mother uh, do with me what she did when I embraced Islam, to fight my own and to use these, you know, to, to, to get involved in disunity and to get involved in the horrors of what was showing itself in the fitna at the time. He wanted nothing to do with it. Even though he could have asserted himself in a way that he would have certainly had a great share of power and a great share of leadership, and people would have yielded to him because of who he was. His position was well known. But Sa'ad radiallahu anhu is someone who wants to spend his time in the da'wah, spend his time doing good, spend his time spreading Islam, not spend his time fighting the Muslims from within. He knows that there's no benefit in that whatsoever. And the Prophet Sallallahu had warned him of that as well. And there's something that you're finding, by the way, as a common theme that so many of these Sahaba that would live to see these unfortunate times of disunity and dissension and the uh, induced fitan from the outside that led to all sorts of turmoil on the inside and confusion on the inside. But they had messaging from the Prophet Sallallahu that deeply impacted them as to how they would carry themselves when those things would take place. And there's one narration that I'll share here that you know his, one of his children, which by the way, when I say one of his children, remember how in Fatih Mecca, he only had one daughter, uh, by the time he died, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had over 20 children. Okay, so he lived long and he had many children. And one of his children came to him and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu was literally uh, shepherding sheep in the mountains away from the people. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu said that there would come a time of fitna where it's better to just literally take your sheep, avoid everybody. And just, you know, the, the greatest thing that you could do is just have your little share of wealth, um, take care of yourself, take care of your family, and avoid it all. And so that's what Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, this man of prominence is doing. And one of his children wanted him to take a more active role because he wanted a share of that power. And so one of his sons comes to him, and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is outside, tending to his sheep, tending to his crops. And when he sees his son coming to him, imagine, he says, I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of what he's coming to bring me. I don't, you know, I, I have a bad feeling about him and what he's bringing to me right now. 
And so what does the son do? He comes to him and he tells him, he says, look, you know, all this is happening and you are who you are. And if you went out there, you could assert yourself and you could have power and you could have all sorts of, uh, you know, of, of glory and you could, you could claim your rightful position. And Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he refuses it all and he says the beautiful hadith which he narrates, he says, Inna Allah yuhibbul abd al-taqi al-ghani al-khafi. He said, rather Allah loves his servant who is taqi, who is pious, he leaves off sins, who is ghani, who is independent of the people, so he leaves off asking from the people or needing the people anything, and who is khafi, who is obscure, who's not seen by the people. SubhanAllah. So he says, In Allah yuhibbul abd al taqi al ghani al khafi. And that's how he wanted to live his life, the end of his life, obscure, uh, self sufficient, and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not indulging the people's sins, nor indulging their praise, nor indulging their wealth. I want nothing to do with any of it. I'm going to take care of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me and be productive in ways that I know are productive and leave off all of this fitna. And there's something for, for, for all of us um, in that regard to really take into consideration as turmoil uh, you know, uh, envelopes us in so many different ways. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and allow us to have these beautiful qualities that Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu would abide by that and he would pass away radiallahu ta'ala anhu indeed a abd who is taqi, ghani, khafi. And while he was obscured from the people and self-sufficient and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certainly claims his rightful place in history. And just to be from those that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa promised Jannah and from those who, uh, who early on uh, came to the Prophet وسلم, and would offer everything and gives us a, you know, gives us an example of one who would be, uh, you know, hurt by his own mother in that regard uh, for embracing Islam and how Allah taught us to treat our parents even in that regard. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu and allow us to learn from his example. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us with him and with the blessed companions and the family of the Prophet sallallahu and the Prophet sallallahu in Jannat al-Firdaus. Allahumma ameen. Jazakum Allah khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.